Welcome to this month's Evidence of Greatness. Um, and for this month, we're actually going to consider um, kind of a meta-analysis of theories about why people do what they do. Um, and so as you can see here, Eister, Satterfield, and Chan, um, they looked at many, many different theories about um, human action and they tried to look across disciplines. Um, some of those disciplines might be law, anthropology, psychology, um, management, economics, all of those kinds of things. And they, in essence, took all of these theories and they said, what, how do we determine what people do um, and why they do it? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that um, because, um, you know, I guess you might be wondering why we're gonna be talking about this a little bit is because as psychotherapists, as people who are working um, from a solution focused perspective, um, we are trying to enact change to help people to create change in their lives. And so I just wanted to highlight some of the major theories um, about um, why people do what they do, um, especially as they're trying to um, create change. Um, and I'll kind of um, include some of my own personal commentary as well as we go throughout this process. So um, first, one of the things that we have to start with is why do we need to study human action theories? Um, and, and the authors of the study, they talk about how um, as a, well, first of all, I guess I'd say as we as solution-focused free therapists, we interact with humans and we're trying to enact change within them and also between people. Um, and so it might suit us well to say, what do we know about why people do what they do? Then the rest of these bullet points come from the authors of the study and they kind of um, give a rationale for why they think it's important to study human action theories. Um, the first of all is, the first point is that understanding human action is essential for addressing um, social issues, economical issues, ecological issues, climate change, all of these kinds of things they're saying, um, in essence, in this world, every kind of problem that exists um, interfaces with humans. And therefore we need to understand why humans do what they do if we want to kind of take a look at these issues. Second, they talk about how research is often housed in different disciplines, like I mentioned before, maybe um, economics, maybe law, maybe psychology, you know, maybe uh, anthropology, sociology, those kinds of things. And so we don't do a good job of cross-discipline collaboration or cross-discipline communication. And so this means oftentimes that there are only certain theories that are being applied in certain situations. And perhaps there are other relevant topics or, or places where those issues might be um, relevant. Um, in addition, um, bringing all of these theories together could potentially result in a, a better theory or more relevant theories, um, something that's more inclusive or an all-inclusive theory about why people do what they do. Um, and so again, it kind of begs the question for us as um, psychotherapists, um, but also I guess just solution-focused clinicians, um, we also often work in various um, fields of obviously psychotherapy is really embedded in to a psycho uh, psychology or psychotherapy arena. Um, but many people are doing um, solution focused work in hospitals. So in medical arenas, um, many people are doing this in coaching situations within business, right? So those economic situations, um, schools. So do we as solution focused thinkers, as we fit into those various fields, um, could we benefit from understanding how human action takes place? Um, so as far as this study goes, one of the things that they did is that they did um, kind of a content analysis, um, a little bit of a qualitative analysis as well. Um, so they considered, they looked at all of these different domains and they considered any theory that described the relationship between human action and any other set of variables. And that's how they decided to include the theory or not. Um, in addition, what they did as a result of this, as they were trying to get the breadth of theories to include, 
They did a web search. Um, they, they also targeted social science domains. So they went to these different domains um, and they, they looked at the theories. And then when those theories um, interacted with other theories or cited other people, then they, then they looked at those domains as well. And that's what they call snowball sampling. So they started with what they knew. And then as they discovered more and more then they started including those as well. And then they went to scholars within these different domains and they talked to them and interacted with them to see what theories might um, need to, um, what theories they might need to include. So all of this different kinds of sampling um, resulted in 86 theories being included in the study. Um, then how they described it is that they went through an inductive process that was grounded. So this is, I'm guessing, they didn't really talk about this a little, a lot, but I'm guessing that grounded term that they used is similar to a grounded theory where they're doing a qualitative analysis of these 86 theories. And what they're trying to do is create a new theory or develop a theory that kind of explains what do people do. Um, and then this inductive process means that they didn't go in necessarily with a hypothesis to say, this is what, um, this is what we think the result is going to be, but instead they kind of just let the theories um, come about, looked for themes, looked for what stood out to them, and then inductively tried to explain what they were discovering. So they then did coding, which is really um, consistent with qualitative analysis, um, especially grounded theory analysis. Um, and they, they coded them upon on all of these different theories on five axes. What discipline did it come from? Um, what unit of action? Was this an individual theory or was this a collective theory? Um, so in essence, are we thinking about what humans do on an individual level or on a more societal or group level? Um, they also looked at the type of action. Um, so was it voluntary action um, or was it forced action? Um, they also looked at explanatory logic. So was this to describe the action or was the theory meant to just describe what the action was or was the theory to change action? So was it a speculative about what might create change? And then the fifth axis was um, they looked at the foundational assumptions, assess, assumptions underlying each of the theories. Um, and from this, um, then they created these graphs and I'll show you an example of one of these graphs, but it comes um, in this circular form where they're linking the various theories um, with the various components on these axes. Um, so they said then that this categorization was useful, um, but because it's inductive, because it wasn't really bound, grounded on a hypothesis, they said that means in essence, it could be imperfect. And at times they might arbitrarily have needed to make decisions about how these things fit onto these various axes. So um, that's um, how they went about kind of discovering what they discovered. Now on the left, you can see a, not a great quality picture, but you can see a picture of kind of how they did, did, it, did this analysis. On the left side, you see lots of things written in blue and those are the different fields um, or the domains within which these theories came from. So you'll see things like um, that biggest purple region, that's psychology. So there's a lot of um, theories about human behavior from the psychology, which you can understand and which makes a lot of sense. Um, then that, those, those two red sections in the middle, those are anthropology and sociology. And so again, um, these fields are looking at what do people do and how do they do it and why do they do it? And then interestingly, that kind of purple, that bigger purple section down at the bottom, um, down here, this is economics. Um, so how do people make economic decisions? How do we make economic policy? Those kinds of things. So you can see different domains had different um, amounts. Um, if you look at these little yellow sections here, these are things like neuroscience, archeology span and literature. So not so much um, theory is coming from those domains as other domains. Then all of this stuff on the right that's green, those then are each of the theories. So those 86 theories that they described, 
um, you can see then how these different domains map onto the different theories. Um, and you can see a lot of the psychological theories that are up here in purple, they map onto individual theories without much um, overlap with other domains. So this is what they were talking about before where the theories might be centered in one domain, but not really applicable elsewhere, or other domains might not be aware that these theories exist um, to help explain um, within their domains. Whereas you can see, oh, sorry. Whereas you can see um, in other arenas, um, uh, the diffusion down here, there's this big section here, which is um, diffusion of, into, in, of innovations. So how do you um, create an innovation? Then how do you get that information about the innovation out? And a lot of the things that map onto that are things like communication, um, education, history. So you can see how those domains might then um, cross check um, within innovation and how the how the understanding of innovation is is shared and created. So that's kind of how you can see how they came up with this methodology. And then what they did is they developed what they called the meta theories. They developed eight different meta theories. And I just wanted to share a couple of things um, about these meta theories before I tell you what they are. The first thing, a direct quote from the article says, meta theories dictate which, which explanations researchers look for. If a human takes action X, the cause could either be Y or Z or innumerable other causes. By limiting causes to Y or Z, meta theories constrain the types of questions asked, the answers obtained and the implications of these answers. So in essence, what that means is these theories speculate or hypothesize um, that, that humans do X and that leads to um, certain outcomes that they called Y or Z. But these theories might be limited. They might not be actually including some of the other outcomes that are possible. Because we rely on these theories to develop our, uh, our approaches to psychotherapy, um, to speculate about um, what causes people to do particular things, um, we might have a limited perspective simply because our theories are limited to what it is that we're looking for. And so I think that's an interesting thing to say right off the bat is that these meta theories, um, they, might, they might really limit what questions we ask, what answers we get, how we, how we hypothesize about what regular human behavior is. And then that second point down there at the bottom is meta theories assume that a different set of factors generate human action. And I think that's also really interesting because um, we don't actually know um, what is causing a person to do something. We can speculate about it, um, but these theories um, set parameters and say, these factors must have caused this behavior or caused the impetus for this, this action. And so I think this is really interesting because they, even as they're kind of trying to explain how humans do what they do, they do talk about how these meta theories may limit um, what we're talking about, what we're looking for and the answers that we get. So then they divided this up into eight different meta theories. And the first couple are independent um, theories. And that this is really looking at the individual level. They say in the independent self meta theory. So they took all of these 86 studies and they boiled them down to eight common uh, factors in essence of they group together and certain theories fall into this independent self category. Other theories fall into what we'll talk about later is the cognitive needs theory. And so they talk about um, they kind of group together. And so 86 different theories kind of boil down to um, overlapping within eight different domains. Um, so the first two are independent uh, personal level theories. And the, they say things like um, what creates um, the motive or the, or the action of people is my values, my attitudes, my beliefs, my worldview, those kinds of things. That's the independent self and the independent structure says, it's not really individual um, characteristics, but instead it's my individual behavior is influenced by my, the structures that I'm in, my culture, my institutions, the technology that I'm exposed to. So you can see how 
these theories kind of complement each other. One says individual behavior is intrinsically oriented. It comes from things within me. And the other theory says it's externally focused. It's these external factors influence my individual behavior. And so they then critique these and they say, in some sense, um, they don't capture everything. Um, and you can even hear in the way that I described them, this, this complementary component, um, one doesn't completely explain everything. So the first set of theories is saying, what happens on an individual level um, behavior is influenced from this individual level. And then the next set of theories, I believe there's four of them, um, they come from needs. Humans do things or their action is predicated based on what needs they have. And the first of the four is the, their cognitive needs. This basically assumes that the ultimate purpose of why people do what they do is survival or evolutionary fitness. But Importantly, that evolutionary fitness or survival, it's based on my cognitive processing of information. What I think influences my survival is what I'm going to then act on. So they then break it down a bit of like, I want to ensure that the decision I make reflects reality. I want to ensure that I limit how, my, how much energy I need to expend because using a lot of energy is um, inconsistent with evolutionary science. Um, so they're saying, I logic my way through what's going to keep me alive, what's going to help me survive. Um, but one of the things that they talk about as a critique for this is that it addresses um, a very quick solution, but it doesn't really talk about the root cause of what has made the solution necessary. Um, then you get into these other three needs. One is psychological needs, um, one is communal needs, and one is economic needs. So you can probably extrapolate what these are, but in essence, the psychological needs say, my behavior is determined based on what I think is going to create well-being. So I am trying to increase pleasure, reduce pain, um, uh, maximize my autonomy, so for those of you who are in psychotherapy, you probably know a lot of these theories. Freud's theory is about um, increasing pleasure, decreasing pain. Um, you can think about um, increasing autonomy. This is game theory. I try to maximize the benefit for myself and I try to eliminate um, what's the, the costs to myself, right? Um, communal needs then takes it from, I try to make decisions that are socially good. I cooperate with society. So this is where government comes into play. Um, so I'm trying to increase what's good for the most number of people. And then the, the final needs-based meta theory is the economic needs. And I'm basically, I'm acting to maximize utility. So I'm not trying to maximize well-being or psychological factors, but I'm in essence trying to um, maximize what's utilitarian. Um, now, each of these are critiqued in essence because they say it only looks at the individual in psychological needs. It only, it maximizes the communal um, in the communal needs. And so again, those are complementary theories a bit. And economics say, um, all you're trying to really do um, is not necessarily focus on individual or collective, um, but just what's going to create efficiency. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't look at the individual level. And then finally, you have these other two at the end, the top down, which in, in essence says um, humans act because of these hidden systematic factors, things like patriarchal domination and anthro anthropocentrism. Um, so what's uh, these bigger systems, they don't necessarily talk about or explain why they're doing what they're doing, um, but it's these unspoken rules that we follow. Um, uh, but again, one of the critiques of this part is that oftentimes it just relies on theory, but it doesn't tell us then what to do or how to fix something. And then the interdependent, interestingly, is kind of just a collaboration of a lot of these things where it's an interdependent web of values and identities, but also my culture and my politics. So it takes that internal and external. And I think you can see um, throughout time, we've kind of moved from modernism to postmodernism. Um, and now we're even kind of beyond that. Um, 
But again, one of the critiques of this meta theory is that it doesn't tell us how to prescribe change or to predict outcomes. It's more of just an explanatory theory. Um, so I know that was a lot and I know that was kind of convoluted, but in essence, they kind of take all these theories and they say some of them look at the individual level, some of them look at the communal level, some of them look at um, my own personal needs, some of them look at um, bigger societal needs, some of them look at society coming down and telling the individual what to do, and some of them look at the interaction, the interplay between the individual and society. So then what are the conclusions that they draw from all of this? It says, despite the differences of these meta theories, each meta theory is true in a sense, reflecting a particular slice of human action. However, it says most theories assume a simple independent dependent variable relationship. The only one that di differs from that is that last interdependent um, theory being the exception. So why are we talking about this in a solution focused evidence of greatness um, domain? One of the things that I really wanna point out about this is that nowhere in this does it say, now we have a definitive understanding of why people do what they do. And that really helps me to know why we do solution-focused brief therapy. Because in some sense, we can't ever get to the root cause. We can, we can speculate, we can have hypotheses, we can look at contextual factors, and we can approximate what people are doing and why they're doing it. But we can't say with definitiveness, um, this is the causal result. And if, if through all of these theories, through 86 different theories, we can't actually get to a definitive, this is the right answer, the kind of begs the question, do we need all those theories? And I think that's one of the beauties of solution-focused brief therapy is that in some sense it says, theories are nice to hypothesize or explain, but when we get to how we practice, perhaps it's not the most advantageous to pay attention to why do you do what you do? But instead look forward and say, what would you like to do? If, if the future can be created, if the future can be negotiated, if the future can be planned, or, or if I have any influence on my future, why not spend time talking about that where I do have control, where I do have influence, instead of looking at something that seems arbitrary, that seems like who knows why we do what we do, or how did I get where I got? So I think that's one thing is um, all of these 86 theories may not help us to know what do we do from here? Um, the other thing that I would say about this is that all of these theories, these 86 theories, these meta theories, um, it all kind of boils down to they're developed looking at a problem. And they say, when people don't function very well, when their attachment isn't very good, or when there's an economic problem, or where there's a climate issue, or where then how do people behave in connection to that problem? And I think again, from a solution focused perspective, that may not be the most adaptive way to look at something. In some sense, we might want to look at regardless of the problem, what do we want the future to look like? Um, if, if, the, if you look at this article, one of the common examples that they give is climate change. And they say from all of these different meta theories, how could we influence climate change. And I would say in some sense, it might make sense for us to look to the future and to say, what kind of climate do we want? And therefore let that dictate what our behavior needs to be in, in order to get to the outcome that we want. And so I think that's one of the things that I really pull from this, this meta summary of all of these theories is that so many of them are trying to explain how we got here or how we interact with the problem or what our behavior is when we, when we connect to a problem. But solution-focused therapy takes a radical difference, different approach and says, what if we don't look at the problem at all? What if we look at what do we want the outcome to be? Now, these theories might not fit um, or maybe um, I'll take attachment theory, for example. Maybe if we say, I wanna secure attachment, we start to explain the kinds of things we need to do in order to have a secure attachment. And I can start moving in that direction rather than simply 
explaining why I'm in a problematic or maladaptive situation that I'm in now. So I think that's one of the things I think is really important about this is that there's lots of explanatory theories, um, but we might be more, um, we might be served better if we look at future development theories. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. I would love to hear what you think about this and have to say about this. But I think this is really, really fascinating work. It's so important. And, and, and the amount of work that went into capturing these 87, 86 different theories from multiple disciplines, um, that's a significant amount of work. And I'm really appreciative to the scholars who did this work. Um, but I would really like to hear your thoughts about this. Is it important for us to, um, to have these explanatory theories um, in order to create human change? Do we need to understand why humans do what they do in order to, um, in order to impact what, what they will do next? Um, so let me know what you think about this. I'm, I'm happy to hear um, your thoughts and feedback. And also if you have other questions um, or articles that you would like me to look at and kind of review for this process, please let me know as well. Um, but thanks for being here. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Evidence of Greatness, and we'll see you again next month.